So good morning, everybody, and you're all very welcome to the first in our masterclass series, uh, Startup Methodologies That Work and Why. My name is Liam Fitzgerald, and I will be joined today by Ron Imink. Ron, you might say hello there to everybody. Hello, everybody. Greetings hello. from sunny Spain. How the weather is good over here than it is in, uh, in Ireland. Excellent. Thanks, Ryan. So for the next couple of minutes, I'm just going to do some short introductions. Then I'll be handing you over to Ryan. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen again and run through what our agenda will be for today. OK, so we'll start off. So first and foremost, we're interested to know who's on the call this morning. And with that in mind, I will have sent you a link to a, a Slido um, earlier today. So as I'm talking for the next couple of minutes, please do listen, but take the opportunity also to click on that link. There are three short questions there. Just gives us a, an overview of who's in the audience, where you're from, and what you might like to get from today's session. So I invite you to click on that link. It's, it's also shown on the screen now. Um, click on that link and answer some of the questions and we'll get a feel for who's in our audience. I'm going to talk a little bit now about things to consider around intellectual property. Then I'll hand over to Ryan and he will do the, the, the bulk of, of our session today around startup models that work and why. Similar to last week, for those of you who were on the call last week, we'll use the hashtag uh, uh, Ireland to zero for anybody that's using social media. Okay, so maybe to talk a little about, a bit about intellectual property. Many of you out there now have ideas, uh, are working on research that might be new, might be novel, might in themselves have some value. So we are very anxious that to encourage you now to look at the intellectual property that might be around your idea uh, and to be sure that you are dealing with that correctly. So on screen now, there's a, a definition, if you like, from Knowledge Transfer Ireland, who are, um, if you're in a, a higher education institute in the Republic of Ireland, Knowledge Transfer Ireland are a, a body who bring together all of the third level institutions. And they have this definition of intellectual property on their website. Any intangible asset consisting of knowledge and ideas allows for research work to be owned in the same manner as physical property and protects it from infringement or copying. So if you have some IP, it can be bought and sold like any form of property and can also be rented out by the process of licensing, resulting in significant commercial and financial benefit for individuals, research groups and organizations. So having intellectual property that is protectable in your idea, in your research, creates value in that idea business and commercial value. So we're very anxious that you would um, be aware of that. There are different types of intellectual property just to make, make people aware of. There are some automatic uh, intellectual property types, which essentially you can enjoy, uh, free to enjoy things like uh, copyright. So if you are involved in, in some artistic works, for example, or if you create some graphics, trade secrets. So keeping, keeping the, um, keeping secret what it is that your product or service or idea does, that confidentiality piece protects it. Um, Know-how, so you have some commercial advantage that you can glean, some know-how that you have that's particular to you or your organization, that's an automatic intellectual property. Then there are registrable uh, intellectual properties and for example, uh, patents, so for an invention or a function or a process, Trademarks for things like names, logos, and, sl and slogans, and there again, register designs for appearance, shape, and configuration. So there are just some ideas, some of the types of intellectual properties that are relevant to our conversation and might be relevant to you. So some things to consider. What I would suggest as a starting point, if you are connected with a higher education institute, either um, in the Republic of Ireland or in, the Nor in Northern Ireland, um, the first thing I would do just to confirm is to go and consult early with your technology transfer office, your commercialization office within the college, university or institute, whatever entity is responsible for IT or sorry, IP in your uh, institution. 
Uh, I would go and I would Google search and download the IP policy for your institution. That will give you information and contacts of the people to talk to. And I've included here some, some links that are relevant to different um, jurisdictions. So Knowledge Transfer Ireland, for example, is, is relevant to the Republic of Ireland and gives a listing of all the technology transfer offices in the Republic. I've included the Queen's University Belfast, for example, um, IP policy. I've also included the Ulster University IP policy there, a link to that. And there's a, a guide on the bottom link there to various um, practicalities around IP. So we'll be making this um, presentation available after our uh, session today. So you can click on any of these links and follow the links. If you are not associated with a higher education institute, uh, so if you're an early stage startup, for example, um, good sources of information on IP and patenting and so on would be in the Republic of Ireland, the, the Patents Office, which is based out of Kilkenny, and there's a link to that. And in Northern Ireland, there's a link there to the Intellectual Property Office there. Uh, I've also included a number of links, as you will see on screen, which are relevant in terms of booklets. There are some very good booklets available from the patent offices covering some of the aspects of IP. So that's um, something that you can, you can look at as well. So in the round, what, we're, what, what the advice would be here is that in the first instance, contact those responsible for IP in your institution if you are associated with an institution. Read the policies and guides provided here and available online through the various links that I've given. Um, contact your patents office or seek professional advice if you are in any doubt around um, your around whether IP is relevant to your idea or research or invention. Um, take that professional advice because it's important. And I suppose in terms of the broadly what we'll be doing today and over the next number of weeks with the masterclass series we are interested in what you want to do or what you can do we're not interested in the detail of how you do it and i think that's probably an important point to make ron will be talking about over the next while um the a, a model for a start for startups and he'll be talking about things like what's the problem that you're looking to solve and then what is your solution for example. So in that context, we're not really interested to know the intricacies of what your solution is. We're interested to know, generally speaking, what it is you're going to do. So <clears throat> maybe to take an example, last week was a very significant week in, in uh, the Republic of Ireland with the publishing of the Climate Act Revised Climate, Climate Action Bill with uh, five-year budgets for different sectors will be coming from that. So uh, it's also um, a significant week in, in Northern Ireland with um, um, the Minister for the Economy, Diane Dobbs, Dobbs um, publishing um, a consultation paper around the um, move to net zero by 2050 for Northern Ireland. So um, we had two very similar occurrences, if you like, both north and south of the border over the last week. So let's say, for example, your idea was around um, helping large business to track their carbon footprint, okay? And, and let's say you were uh, designing a platform, a software platform, that made it very easy for business to track their carbon footprint across different aspects of their operation, okay? That might be your idea. In giving that level of information, you're not giving away any secrets or you're not compromising your IP. Whereas if you were to go and show us the code that's behind your uh, product or service and start to go into the intricacies of how you actually have developed that platform, obviously then you're compromising potentially your, your, your IP. So we just want to know at a high level, what is it that your solution looks like without the intricacies of how you actually manage to do that. So. On that note, I think I'm going to, hopefully we've had some people um, using the Slido at this point. And depending on the amount of interaction we've had, we might start to put up some graphics just to show who's in the audience and so on and so forth. Maybe if we haven't had enough interaction, we might leave it for a little while, but I'll leave that up to Tara, who's, who's online on, in the background here at the minute. 
Tara, you might let us know how we're how we're looking there. Okay. So very interesting. So we've had we've only had 20 people so far. So there's an opportunity for everybody to continue using the um continue using the Slido as we move forward. But it's interesting to see that we have uh, as an interesting spread, 43% uh, of people at the minute describe themselves as early stage startups, and 19% postgrad, 19% researcher, 19% um, other, and we have no PhD candidates right now. But the numbers are, are, we've got more people interacting as we go along. So we might move on to the next one, Tara, just to see how that looks. Okay, there again, so in terms of the spread of where people are, are joining us from, we have 50% from Munster, um, 32 from Leinster, Connacht kind of 9%, and unfortunately we have nobody from Ulster right now, but as I say, we've only got 22, 23 people after interacting on Slido, so please, everybody that's out there, continue to interact, and we can, we can maybe show these graphics later with more interaction. And the final one we had, Tara, was around, okay, interesting, so we asked the question, what is the main thing you want to get from this session? Um, and people were invited to put in um, anything that they were interested in. And knowledge is, is coming across as being the, the strongest theme there. Um, and you can see there's lots of, lots of other themes as well. In, inspiration, accelerator idea, business model, sustainability. Very interesting. So there's a lot of different startup guidance. So there's a lot of interesting stuff here. And this is very helpful from our perspective to understand who's out there right now it can be a little bit unusual sitting in a room by yourself delivering um, a program like this. And, and uh, in that context, I know Ron, when, when he delivers programs, um, the, what the audience is saying and the interaction with the audience is very important. So this is, this is I suppose, as, as close as we can get to understanding what the audience are interested in right now. So. That's great. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Ron at this point. And Thank you, Liam. Ron, over to you. Thank you, Liam. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. Bear with me for a second. So you're all very welcome. I'm delighted to be here. Now, does this work for you? Okay, so thanks, uh, Liam. Um, my job is for the next one and a half hour or one hour and 50 minutes is to be your host. To give you a little bit about my, my background, I am originally from, uh, from Holland. I, in, 19, in February 1994, I fell in love with an Irish girl and moved over to Ireland. I wrote a few books on business planning. I actually ran the innovation center in uh, DCU, so I know all about IP, invention disclosure, and uh, commercialization. Uh, then did some work with some of the banks around supporting entrepreneurs moved to Spain in 2017 and I've been writing books and over the last 25 years I think I've I've literally helped and supported thousands of startups and for the last five years I've been very much involved in helping entrepreneurs that want to tackle climate change as one of my specialities so I hope today to give you sort of an overview or sort of two uh, approaches that I think work very very well now before I do that um, this is supposed to be about you. So if there are any topics or questions you want me to cover in the next hour or so, can you uh, leave a comment in the comment box and hopefully I can uh, pick it up. And the, the way this is going to work, I'm just going to do a very short introduction. And then we're going to go into a, a rhythm of I will talk for about two or three minutes. And then I give you about three, four, five minutes to go and actually do something and then reflect. As you reflect, you might uh, have questions, so then use the little wave your wave hand uh, function, and you can either ask the question in the forum, and other people can uh, listen to my answer, or you can uh, use the the, the comment uh, box. So that's the way I like to, to go. So, does anybody have any questions or topics at the moment that you want to cover? I'm just going to check because I can't see the comment box. So. If uh, Tara, if anything happens, just uh, will you let me know? Okay. Yes, no problem. Thank you. So the program for today is I'm just going to do a very quick overview of some of the trends that are in the area of sustainability and, and, and climate change. And I think the main conclusion is that you are, as an entrepreneur, you are in the 
in an incredibly interesting space. And the size of the opportunity, I, I, I think that the size of the opportunity is bigger than the internet. It, I, it's, it's, it's about 90 trillion and it's constantly moving up. And the nice thing or the bad thing, dependent on your perspective, is that we are also have limited time to spend that 90 trillion because if we don't solve this problem in, in the next 30 to 40 years, we'll all be having gills and be swimming in a very large pool of, uh, of water. So I'm just going to set the scene very, very briefly. I will explain the, the two approaches, uh, which is the pitch and what we call the, the, the climate launch plat uh, methodology. And the cadence or the, the rhythm is I talk for five minutes, then you have an opportunity to maybe work on some of those uh, issues for five minutes. And what I will ask you to do, and I will ask again at the end of the session is, if you can email me the results of those, uh, I will have a look at it, maybe comment on it, and maybe use that for the next session uh, uh, on the 14th or 15th of uh, April. So if you look at the, the most interesting, so when I started this, I was the national coach for climate launch paths uh, for about five, six years. And the focus was very much only on carbon. And what has happened in the last four or five years, because climate change just, just didn't be that much on the radar of a lot of uh, organizations. It has moved way beyond carbon. So now it's in food. We're talking water issues. We're talking waste issues. We're talking air issues. I think soil is an incredibly interesting um, area because uh, soil in particular, my, my uh, partner in life is doing Ayurveda, which is a Indian... Uh, healing uh, methodology that soil particularly is very much attached to our uh, biome and an internal uh, organ. So I think soil is going to be uh, nature, plastics, pollution. There is an enormous pressure on a lot of commodity prices. So uh, in a lot of cases, the supply lines for large companies is actually under uh, threat. And again, it is the biggest business opportunity in the history of mankind. If you look at some of the trends that are happening, um, one of the first one is when we started talking about climate change five, 10, year, 10 years ago, we were literally seen as hippies in business, uh, sandals, woolly socks. But what you're now seeing is that the large venture capitalists are now looking at climate as an opportunity. And the climate, the capital stack is actually shifting because not only are um, VCs looking at it and angels, banks are now no longer looking at climate change as an irritant nearly, but they're now understanding that um, not being sustainable is a risk. So the risk, the, 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 the non being not sustainable is now a risk factor in the loan portfolio. And I know from, uh, I did some work with AIB that AIB is actually uh, reviewing their loan portfolio and examining which of the companies that they're currently lending to are sustainable. If they're not, they're deemed more risky. And very soon, you can wait for it in the next two, three, four years, non-sustainable businesses will pay a higher interest rate than sustainable businesses. And it will either be a discount or you'll be penalized for being uh, not sustainable. And you can just wait for that to happen, not only in Ireland, but all over the, the world. If you look at... Uh, from a supplier uh, perspective, one third of the large suppliers in the world have now sustainability uh, as part of the supplier guidelines, which may basically means that if you are not within their guidelines around uh, water, uh, waste, pollution, etc., you will no longer be a supplier for those uh, companies. I think, and Facebook, uh, I have some opinions about, about Facebook, but Facebook, for example, does only have uh, climate guidelines. They also have diversity guidelines. So you really have to fit within the guidelines. So how diverse are you as a company? If you're not diverse enough, you are not, uh, you will no longer be supplying to the company. And again, that's gonna, it's one third now. You can wait for it that in the next 10 years, it's be two, two third, and maybe uh, nearly 90%, which means that the whole value chain will be forced to become uh, sustainable. 
consumers are increasingly asking for uh, companies that are sustainable and uh, have an eye on the climate. And I think for me, the shining example of a company that actually has embraced that to its fullest is Patagonia. And I believe increasingly will there be more and more Patagonia type companies uh, in, uh, in the world. If you, and we'll come back to that, if you look at from a, from a market research perspective and from a key driver for your business, you just have to look at, uh, Liam already made uh, referred to it, the Climate Action Plan in uh, the Republic of Ireland and the Climate Action Plan in uh, the north of Ireland. But the, uh, the ones that you really should look at are all the EU regulations that are coming down the, the track. So at the moment, Ireland is being fined for being not compliant those regulations are going to get tighter and tighter on not only carbon, but also on water, pollution, plastic, you just, the whole list that I already gave you. So regulation is going to be a predictor of some of your success. So one of the things I would advise you is to have a very good look at the EU regulations that are coming down the track and then probably expect those regulations to become more and more stringent. You're going to be paying for water pollution, you're going to be paying for pollution, you're going to be paying for carbon, you're going to be taxed on carbon, you're going to be taxed on fossil fuels. So there's quite a lot of things coming down the, the tracks. There's this whole new thinking around our whole economic system at the moment is linear. That makes no sense whatsoever, particularly when uh, you know that you're running out of minerals and uh, raw materials. So increasingly business models will become circular. Um, the other thing which I think is incredibly interesting is the whole uh, area of generative, regenerative uh, economy, which is, I don't know if anybody has read the book, The Donut Economy, that basically suggests that our growth, uh, economic growth model and even our uh, obsession with GDP is completely the wrong way to run an economy and that this focus on growth is just no longer sustainable. We already are, uh, I think, spending per year one and a half times the resources that the planet has uh, available. So I think in the future, economic growth will come out of regenerative models, which means that the growth will be in restoring the ocean back to its natural state. It'd be about restoring the soil to its natural state. It'd be about forestry, but in a regenerative way. And that's going to be the biggest growth sector in the uh, economy. The whole area of uh, collaborative, which is the shared uh, economy, is going to be so possession. Owning things the way we know it is increasingly less likely to be the model that people will uh, apply. There's an incredibly, uh, the whole area of biomimicry. I don't know if anybody has read anything about Nassim Taleb, but uh, if you, nature and evolution has designed things to its optimum. So why would you not follow nature's design as a way to design your products and your uh, services? The whole idea of that in the future, you cannot design a product which has a waste or pollution element. It will just no longer be uh, accepted or you will be taxed up to the hilt. And I think the most interesting perspective is that I think, and I'm, I'm not the only one, that very soon the business model that, you will be, that you're applying will be costed at full capital cost, not only the cost as in paying for uh, energy, but also the impact you have on nature. So if you're using, I think the, 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 the numbers are staggering, but I think for every cup of coffee, you uh, 100 liter, 1000 liter of water is being used. You will have to pay for those 1000 liters of water. If you, if Coca-Cola leaves plastic in the ocean, Coca-Cola will have to pay for getting the plastic out of the ocean and restore the ocean to the natural state. So that it's gonna be all charged at full cost, which makes every business model we currently apply completely unsustainable, but that's it's very likely the way it's going to, to go. And uh, again, the biggest market opportunity in the history of mankind. And uh, the good news of the bad news is we just don't have much long, uh, long left. And just to give an example, of some of the, the companies that are already 
embracing the uh, sustainability. Now, Unilever, Walmart, Patagonia, Johnson & Johnson, there's definitely an element of greenwashing uh, involved, but uh, it is an indication of a trend. And we already know that in Ireland, one third of purchasing with the large companies is subject to sustainability guidelines. We're gonna get more and more stringent as we uh, go along. This is just, I read lots of books. Some of you have downloaded some of my, uh, my books. All the books that I'm reading, sustainability is forefront of nearly every management theory, every type of uh, thinking, and it's actually exponentially increasing that type of, uh, of, of thinking. So before I do this, I'm just gonna stop now. Just give me one sec. Does anybody have any question so far or any comments, anything they want to raise? Ron, there's some questions in I the Q&A yes, and good. I, um, on your email, thank you. Uh, where can we find the checklist of the EHS list? No idea, but I would say if you go to the European Commission website, there must be ways to uh, find it. And uh, I work for Climate Kick. I think within Climate Kick, there must be a list somewhere of uh, regulations. And, and, and then you shouldn't underestimate, dependent on the sector that you are uh, in, because there's climate kick, but there's materials kick, there's energy kicks, there's loads and loads of kicks and other uh, DGs within uh, Europe. All of those, those DGs are now uh, have sustainability and climate as part of their uh, thinking. And that is actually because he's, it's a Dutch guy. There's a Dutch, com Dutch commissioner that, who is responsible for climate. And if you follow that guy, uh, Isolbloom, I think is his uh, name. I will look it up and I will put it on an, uh, on an uh, email. If you follow that guy, you will get most of the thinking from Europe around um, regulation. Okay, will I move on? So, before we go, any further, would you mind in your, uh, in your idea box, leave uh, your idea of what you're uh, thinking about. And then what is, because I'm assuming that if you don't have an idea, it's gonna be difficult to follow the rest of the, of the, of the, of the, of the program because I would assume you're an idea and then you have to realize that an idea is actually only 5% of the, the challenge and it's actually 95% of the uh, execution. And I don't have time to go into um, ideas or creativity, but my advice to you is that rather than focusing on a single idea, is try to define your idea as wide as, uh, as possible and uh, start with looking at some of the trends. And in the, in the next session, I will talk a little bit about information dashboard and some of the things that you need to look out for but you need to watch uh, trends. There is uh, a concept called the five why. So why, 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 why is this a good idea? And one of the things I always apply to nearly all the clients that I work with is this thing called attribute listing, which means that you split up your idea in the smallest parts possible and then look for alternatives. So you, you, you create a mind map, idea in the middle, and then you start to expand into so uh, small parts, and an alternative for small parts. And then particularly in the area of technology, AI, IoT, blockchain, et cetera, et cetera, there are probably parts of your idea that can readily be expanded or improved. So you get a mind map of all the things that are possible within your idea. So you get a much broader perspective on your data rather than focusing on a single focus. But I would be really interested you're getting a fix on some of the ideas that you have. So if you could just take five, sorry, not five minutes, one minute, two minutes to leave your idea in the comment box, please. And Helen, you found the comment box. So is anybody willing to share their idea?
Ron, I'm just checking with you that you can see the I can, uh, yeah, I'm just comments. looking at it now. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks. So carbon footprint monitoring, community marketplace to connect sustainability. Using technology to improve climate change knowledge. That's a very broad, um, that's probably a little bit too broad. Citizen engagement. Interesting, decarbonizing industrial heat. Hemp, yes, very popular and very interesting. Electronic devices and sustainable develop, uh, addition of heat. Or, sorry, electrification of uh, heat. So, okay, thank you. Retrofit, yes. Um, I worked with the Strategic Bank Corporation and retrofitting of houses is a very, very large challenge. Market diffusion of electric vehicles. So, Vahid, what would what such market diffusion means? Hydrophonics, marine plastic plant project, which I presume is about collecting plastic and making plant pots out of them. And I think some of those models already uh, exist. Coffee grounds, very interesting. Very good. Monitoring uh, marine biodiversity. Carbon finance, uh, drop me an email because I actually worked with Climate Launchpad of a company that used blockchain to do exactly that part. Uh, and uh, I think some of you should probably look at Climate Launchpad uh, because some of those models have been uh, around so you could look at them. Okay, thank you very much. And I will go back to my sharing my screen. Okay, let's bear with me for a second. Okay, there's two approaches. And uh, and just on the on the just and, and just on the the idea because it just the thing that you have to realize is that in whatever area you're going to start your business in, you need to become the undisputed thought leader. So if I know more about your concept and those concepts, future trends, markets, clients, suppliers, potential, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then you are. Uh, your chances of succeeding are going to be very, very limited. So you need to become the absolute thought leader in whatever area you're trying to decide to start your own uh, business uh, in. So when I worked for Dublin City University, I had the pleasure of going. Uh, we had a, uh, a partnership with Arizona State University. And when I went there, I had the opportunity to uh, attend some of their uh, masterclass in the area of entrepreneurship. And one of the first things that I saw is that uh, in a program of three months, the first month of that program, they just focused on one particular thing, which is what they call the elevator pitch. And the idea about an elevator pitch is uh, you are uh, in a lift and Lo and behold, Dennis O'Brien steps into the lift with his bodyguards and he pushes the button and he puts, he goes to uh, 10, which gives you about 30 seconds in the lift. And uh, Dennis, nice guy that he is, he's asking you, what do you do? And then you have 30 seconds to explain to Dennis O'Brien what you do. And when the lift opens on the 10th floor, Dennis O'Brien is on his knees. The bodyguard has been assigned to you and he's in his hand, he's holding the black American Express credit card, and he's giving you all the money you need to execute on your idea. So it's all about compelling storytelling and everything in business and in entrepreneurship 
ultimately it actually boils down to compelling uh, storytelling. And there's a structure for that. So you have 30 seconds. If you want to read up on it, it's The Art of Start by Guy Kawasaki. And uh, it is very, very simple. There are three, the structure of a elevated pitch is you have three things. You have a problem and a problem in a lot of cases is a pain point for industry or something that you have uh, identified. Invariably, it's a large problem. So you have to put a number on how large that problem uh, is. There is a solution, which is your idea. Not too much detail. The product is literally irrelevant. How you do it, as Liam said, is irrelevant, but you have a solution and you have something that is special. And the uh, within the problem solution magic, it is a, uh, Ogilvy came up with this a long, long time ago. It's the AIDA formula, which is literally attention, which is within one or two seconds, I'm sitting up. Interest, which is, hmm, interesting. The D of desire going flip or other uh, terms. This is very, very interesting. And then action, which is what can I do to get my hands on this. I want to be part of this because this, this is so super, super cool. I need to be part of this uh, thing. So it needs to be memorable and you constantly need to uh, understand that this is all about storytelling. The more we are exposed to social media, the slower our attention span, the more important it is to tell a really, really good story. And then, and the good news for, 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 uh, for particularly Irish people is that they are phenomenal at uh, storytelling but it needs to be absolutely memorable. And 30 seconds, because if, if you're looking at, there's a book called the, the, the Shallows, 30 seconds is probably already too long. A website is scanned in about one and a half seconds. So you need to be compelling and interesting within one and a half seconds. So your opening sentence is absolutely essential. So when you pitch, when you sell, when you're in a bar, I'm, I'm pretty bad at that. So when I try to explain, I, I do future uh, proofing of uh, organizations and people uh, glaze over. So how do you make sure that people get constantly excited when they hear you talk about your uh, business? So what, what I would now like you to do is for the next two or three minutes, uh, work on your problem, definition of the problem, a definition of uh, the solution and uh, magic. And as you do that for the next two or three, four minutes, you have an opportunity to ask me uh, questions, if that's okay. So stop sharing. I will give you three or four minutes to just write that down. And again, at the end, you can share, you can send me an email and you can share all that uh, thinking with me and I'll be happy to comment as we uh, go along. So does anybody, any questions? Oh, excellent. No raising of hands. Everybody happy so far? Oh, current credit system for algae, very good. Clinical waste disposal, yes. Uh, I know of an organization that's actually looking at clinical waste disposal from a plastics perspective, so I'd be happy to make an introduction. Nobody, any questions? I'll give you two minutes. I've heard in the past that a good elevator pitch you shouldn't scare your audience. I, I, uh, I, I actually, I would scare the living bejesus out of people to be quite honest. So the, the thing you need to remember is memorable. And I'm sure when you ask Liam and so much, so I, I've been judging pitches for 20 years now. 
uh, and reading business plans, there's very few that I actually remember, but there's a few that I do. And some of them come up with really, really scary statistic with actually, so uh, there's a company that recycles cigarette butts and their opening sentence is that cigarette butts as a, as a waste is more poisonous than nuclear waste. So one cigarette butt actually pollutes a thousand liters of water. And it's, it's, a, it's so, cigarette butts are incredibly scary. And ever since I used to smoke, uh, not anymore, but uh, when I would never ever again throw a cigarette butt onto the street because it's so poisonous. So I, I would uh, rather than, I would, be, I would be scary and memorable. Ron, I might just say that if any member of the audience wants to raise their hand, um, we, we can promote them to, to share their screen and talk to you in person Perfect. as well. If, yes. if that's, so if anybody wants to do that, please raise your hand and I'll promote you. Thank you. And uh, is there a way to note this down? Uh, yeah, pen, to, pen and paper, problem, solution, magic. Or email or word. Yeah, I see it recovery. Okay. Nobody, everybody happy? Are we, are we shy? Okay. Will I move on? Sorry, two people have raised their hands. Just bear with me there. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Alejandro. Hi, Ron. I'd be happy to share. Please. Okay, so we just got in into the elevator, 30 seconds kicking in now. Uh, hi, Ron. I use my global agricultural experience to reduce the agricultural emissions by developing a platform that increases the net revenue of farmers as they decrease their carbon footprint. Okay. Do you want me, do you want me to be Dutch or Irish about this? Dutch, direct. Uh, it is incredibly general and not specific enough. Got it, got it. And uh, pain invariably can, uh, particularly if it's B2B or, or a problem, can always be translated in, uh, in money. So how, how big a problem is this? In, uh, in, in money terms, in, uh, in, say it again, again, Alejandro. It is massive. 33% of the greenhouse gas emissions of Ireland come from agriculture. There you go. That's a nice opening statement. Costing, the, costing the Irish economy 100 billion. We have a solution that is so spent, blah, 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 blah. And the magic or what is different is that it is whatever. Taka, 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 taka. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Neve? Hello, Ron. Uh, I was just wondering, you were saying that we should be the creative lead in whatever business we come up with, but I don't, I'm not sure if this is the right place to ask this, but could we enter the All-Ireland Startup Competition as a trio? Of course. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Which is a very good point, and I will come back to it because it's a lovely segue to uh, the, the other part, of the, which is the, the Climate Launchpad uh, methodology. It, is, it makes a lot more sense to start as a team rather than starting as an individual because three just know more than, uh, than one. And uh, if you talk to Enterprise Ireland, if you talk to the Leos, if you talk to investors, if you talk to angel um, investors, nearly the first, believe it or not, they might have a look. So they look at the elevator pitch, but the second thing that they look at is actually the quality of the team because they're, they're gonna give that team the money. So does that team have the ability to actually execute the 95% on actually making this idea uh, uh, happen? So most definitely three is way better than one. That's great to know, thanks. Okay, anybody else? Will I move on?
So, uh, climate launch pad is the is the methodology that they use for climate launch pad, and it's actually a methodology developed by uh, the Dutch. Uh, it is also applied in uh, in Climate Kick, and it is uh, probably. So I've I've developed a few methodologies of my own. Um, I think this is probably the most sharp methodology that uh, I've ever seen because it sort of interlocks everything uh, and it's all numbers driven. So there's very little hiding in what you're uh, trying to do. And, and, and as scientists, you will understand it. A huge part of the methodology here is what they call uh, assumptions, making assumptions and then smashing them. So to make sure that the, that the numbers that you talk about that they actually are true. So this is a constant validation of assumption. So it's, it's in some ways it's very close to uh, to lean and uh, and agile. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take them one by one by one. I explain it very very briefly, then give you a few minutes to uh, to work on it. Do the same thing what we did uh, now. You can raise your hand or ask a question in the in the comment box, and then move one to one to one. So by the end of this workshop you will have the beginning of a slide deck and the beginning of the concept. This is the first iteration. You need to iterate it, but as uh, hopefully as I go through it, you will understand how this actually, uh, how this actually works. So the first thing that we always start with is what we call the founder's dream, which is, there's lots uh, of books around uh, entrepreneurship. There's probably not enough books around passion and uh, and dreaming, and I used to get paid by the enterprise boards in the Leos to scare the living daylight out of people about uh, starting their own business, because if you're doing, if you're starting your business for economic reasons because you want to become filthy rich, the uh, the chance of that happening is pretty limited. So within a year or two. 50%, three years, 50% fail. Then uh, from that other, and other 50% fail. So your chance of succeeding within the next five years is about 30%. And that's before we even start talking about uh, scaling. So ultimately within 10 years, 10% actually uh, survive. And the average life cycle now of a, of a business is about 10, 15 years, and it's starting to get smaller and smaller uh, all the time. And then if you look at from a from an earning perspective, the chances of you making more than uh, being a civil servant for the Irish government is also uh, very limited. So there must be other reasons why you're doing this. And it's important to write down your dream and the reason why you're doing it. And then what we will do, to, so, so why are you doing this? And uh, we will come back to that in the uh, next session when we talk about the strategic box, which is what is your passion statement? What is the thing that makes you come out of bed every day with a big, big smile working on what you're doing? Uh, what's your perspective on the future? Because I think entrepreneurship is all about predicting the, the future. So there's a vision statement and you need to literally, like an athlete, have a picture in the head of where you want to be in five years time. And uh, then the trick in all of this is that if you are a team, so Neve is with three people, that those dreams are exactly aligned. And it's a, it's a really interesting exercise for Neve and her two uh, uh, partners to both separately go hang in a hammock, have a glass of wine, or in, in Holland, have a spliff, hang in the hammock, and dream away of why you're doing this and where you want to be in five years time. Because I presume you want to have uh, an, uh, an impact. And maybe also consider then in the context of the dream of where you want to be in uh, five years times, what other people do you need to, to take on board to help you to achieve what you want to uh, achieve? And then the most important thing that you then need to do is you need to put a number on that aspiration. So it's a goal with a number and that number invariably and it's the easiest way to do it is to put a turnover figure on it so 
you want, uh, Alejandro wants to do something with agriculture and carbon. So in five years time, Alejandro, what's the turnover of your company? Is that 100,000? Is that 500,000? Is that a million? Is that 5 million? And then literally work backwards to where you are now. Because at the moment you are at zero. So in five years time, you need to get to a turnover figure. So you need, literally can sort of map out the milestone that you need to achieve to get to that number. And what you basically start to do is create an aspirational break-even number because you know, dependent on the product that, that you have or service that you have defined, that if you want to get to a million and the average cost or the average price of my service is a thousand, that you will need to sell 10,000 of those products over the next five years. So it gives you a really good indication of what that means in a financial uh, term. So that number, so what I want you to know, I'm gonna stop sharing again. I want you to spend the next five minutes on defining your dream and putting a turnover number on that uh, dream. And in the meantime, I will be available for people that want to ask me a question, have comments, So five minutes, that's be uh, one o'clock. Anybody wants to talk to me? Nobody, we're all shy. Okay, what do you mean by turnover number exactly? That's a very good question. And it just shows you uh, that assumption, it's very dangerous. So it's the number of products that you, or services that you think you are going to, to sell. So if you're selling flower pots as, an, as a bad example, and uh, you think, and say the average price of a flower pot is five euro, then, and you want to sell, 100,000 uh, flower pots in year five, your turnover is 500,000 or half a million. So it's the, uh, your sales target. That's another word for it. Okay, Ron, we have Tobias Lucan who will ask a question. Perfect. Hello, Tobias. Hi, Ron. Um, do you know of any companies in Ireland that are hiring in this sort of space, young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurial minded people who are looking to look at sustainability and maybe advise other companies or just work within a company to make the value chain more sustainable? Oh, that's a fascinating question. Uh, I've been trying to, to set up an intrapreneurship project in Ireland for the banking and insurance sector where the whole idea is that actually entrepreneurial people from within the company come up with ideas that, that tackle climate change and then use the, the large organization as the, the launch pad to launch the idea because it will be much quicker than starting from a startup uh, perspective. And there are companies that are recruiting startups to do that. So uh, Vodafone had a concept called Weira that uh, did the same thing. It used to be incredibly popular. It's less so at the moment for a very strange uh, reason, but outside of Ireland, it is most definitely still happening. But, but uh, what's more likely to happen is, and that's, that's, there are, particularly the large companies are constantly scanning all the accelerators across the world for interesting business concepts. And in a lot of cases, they're not particularly interested in the business concept, but they're interested in the mm -hmm. talents that are behind it. And they actually buy those companies and, and, and what they're doing is, is basically buy the talent that's in those companies. Does that answer the question, Tobias? Yeah, it does answer the question. Um, I think I'll get back to you in private a little bit more about that. Sure, no problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? So we have two minutes left. And there's no wrong 
answer. It's just something you need to start thinking about because I, I presume that you all want to be in business for the next five or 10 years rather than just, uh, and uh, there's, there's, it's very interesting, but if the minute you write down your goals on paper, the chances of getting to that goals has tenfolded. So it's, uh, and there's lots of books around that. Ah, Bernard. Ron, how are you doing? Good to see you again. Not too bad. Likewise, how are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good and, and happy. I, <clears throat> I'm jumping on the call just to motivate myself to, to say something. So it's a case of um, the question, and I, you'll probably allude to it again, but you mentioned it earlier. The team, the idea of building a team. So you start yes. off, you have an idea yourself. Are there different stages yeah. Do you really develop your idea and then draw in the people you need then? Or is it is it better to have people at the ideation stage of the idea? That is a very good question. Uh, and there's not one answer to it, but uh, see, team, teams are nearly part of the storytelling as well. So you see, uh, having Ron Imick on your team is nice but it's not going to make that many people sit up. But if you have uh, O'Leary on your team, that makes a huge in, uh, difference when you start walking to a bank or, a, or a, uh, an angel funder or a, or a venture capitalist. But uh, Dennis O'Brien or Michael O'Leary are not going to step on into, step into an embryonic idea. So dependent on the states of, the, the, of development you're, you're at the, the, the composition of your team neatly changes. And, and that's, the, that, that's, the, that's the painful part of, of entrepreneurship uh, as well, which is as the idea develops, in a lot of cases, the founder and the originator of the, of the idea nearly becomes surplus to requirement. And uh, in the beginning, you just uh, create a coalition of the willing. You, uh, you look for it's, it's basically about, uh, and, and in the booklet that I'm going to make available after this, that it's, 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 about, it's about your ability to pull in the resources that you need. So in the beginning, you might need some really, really creative people and some people that are really good in low code, no code, and can build a, an MVP, minimal vibe product within seconds. Uh, but maybe as you... Uh, develop bigger, you need somebody that is incredibly well connected in, in, in a particular uh, sector. So it literally, and maybe when you start looking for finance, particularly when the VCs, you need some, some hard hitting experienced entrepreneurs that have done it uh, before. So it depends on the states of the idea and the states that you're at. That's probably not an answer, but it's, it's that's the, yeah. Does that answer it, Bernard? Yes, that's excellent, Ron. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I think we have one more um, question oh, yes. there. So, from and, and Vahid. Paul, oh, yes, please, go on, Fahid. Sorry, I think Vahid, are you there? Did you want to ask a question? Sorry, can you, can you hear me clearly? Yeah, yes. yes. Hello, Fahid. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Hello, hello, thank you. And my idea is uh, focusing on decarbonizing transport sector using electric vehicles. But, uh, you know, we are hearing uh, almost everywhere that EVs is the best solution. But the question is that why the consumer should buy an EV with a higher purchase price while still should cope with uh, limited range, significant recharging time and other issues. So my idea is to developing an you know an app that can help people to to you know to, that can encourage them to know uh, adequate information and uh, you know will finally uh, you know guide them to buy or you know not to buy a, an AV. So uh, I, I want to know that what is the best you know. Uh, opening opening sentence for such an idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, don't know. Uh, but if you send me an email with that, 
uh, I might see this. Hydrogen is now becoming, I work for a large organization called Bozal, which is a company that specializes in exhaust. And they think that uh, it's actually going to be hydrogen and fuel cell driven rather than electricity driven. Uh, send me an email and I'll, if, I, if I come up with something interesting, I will uh, send it uh, to you. Thank you uh, for asking Thanks. the question, Fahid. Um, the idea, so the idea, is that's a question from, uh, from Paul. The idea is, uh, is 5%, executing the idea is 95%. There's pockets of people that come up with really good ideas. There's only very few that can actually bring it to the finishing line. So it's 95% transpiration and 5% inspiration. And I see it's already uh, one o'clock, so I'm gonna have to move up a little bit faster. So I'm gonna share my screen again, just bear with me. So you have a number, and then the next part you need to consider is what we call the deal. And the deal is a very simple sentence which says, we, which is you, or uh, in Neve's case, the team sells a product, which is a description of the product in two or three words, to a market or a person or a company, but a very brief definition of the, the market for a price. And that's a number. And I have been working with startups for a very, very uh, long time. I've done um, New Frontiers, and actually very few companies can answer this question from the early start. And when you are pitching, I find most pitching incredibly confusing because I don't understand what you are selling as a product or service to whom for how much. If I know that the product is 100,000 for a particular product or five euros per product, that, uh, that, makes, that gives me a completely different context. So the thing to do after your dream is to formulate that sentence. And it literally works in the slides that we would normally use. There's a box, you, product, a thing or a service, a person or a consumer, which is described and a, uh, a number underneath it. And that's the only slide that we want uh, to see. No blah, 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 blah. There's a product that you're making or, uh, and that you're delivering. There's a price that you're charging and you're charging it to uh, somebody. And then the, the question is, that's actually the reason you're not. Uh, so if you, if you accept that finance is a language that, of business, you have to accept that you need to some, sell something at a price. And this is, I don't know if you remember Jerry Maguire in uh, the movie, don't know, the show me the money uh, clip, which is you need to show me the money as a bank, as an investor, as a team member, as a client, I need to understand what I'm uh, paying. And the, the name of the person you're selling to is the person that pays the invoice, not all the people around it. So somebody takes the wallet out and gives you the money. So it's, uh, you need to become incredibly exact in your description of your product and the pricing point that you're going to apply and the market that you're going to focus on. So think about this as I go to the next slide, but this is in all the work that I've done with clients, this seems to be the most difficult uh, slide for people to actually put together, but it's the most fundamental one because it's the, it's the starting point. And if you can, you can understand, so, see, if you want to sell, if your price per product is 100,000 and you want to reach a million in year five, that is 10 products in five years. If you want to reach 100 million and your product is five euros per, uh, per product, that is, anybody, someone can do the sums, but that's probably a million products to be sold in five years time. So it immediately sets a context of what you are aiming for and, and what it is that I need to look at from, from a financing, buying, et cetera, perspective. So for you to determine who you're actually going to sell to, 
you need to have a really, really deep understanding of the, for a second, of the market. And again, you need to become the thought leader. If I know more than you do, you have a problem. And VCs, banks, nearly everybody that you talk to, clients, if they know more, you're wasting your time. So you need to become really, really good at all those figures. And market research, it's the reason why most companies fail because a lot of companies and a lot of startups just don't do their homework. You need to understand the facts and figures. You need to check whether the assumptions, so there's an assumption that farmers are gonna buy Alejandro's product because you need to check that assumption and to make sure that that is uh, true. And you need to be able to put the numbers on it because we need to get to the number that we have identified as our dream. So you need to, and then the trick, and this is where lots and lots of companies go wrong. This is not about the biggest market. This is actually about the smallest market possible. And we call it beachhead market. In the beginning, you need to pick a really, really small market and make sure that you become the undisputed leader in that particular market. It's your time to test. It's the time your time to, to talk. And it's not about millions of people that you can talk to. In reality, as a, as a founder, you have very limited time. So you can only focus on a very, very, very small market. But before you decide to do that, you need to do an enormous amount of market research. And the reality is that if you want to do this properly, it's going to cost you between six and months, six and three to six months to uh, do that. And you're going to get copies of these slides. These are all the things that you need to quality standards, the legal perspectives, who's doing what, pricing structures, market data, trends, who are the competitors. One of the most underestimated parts of uh, what you're doing, because if I see the ideas that are coming, uh, passing by in the, in the comment box, in all of them, I know of competitors that are doing the same and something similar. So where are you uh, different? You need to understand your customers. So you need to know the buyer. You need to understand the sales cycle. You need to be in a market where there's a little bit of word of mouth. And if you're a thought leader, you will create that word uh, of mouth. You need to make sure that they have the money because uh, I worked with a guy called Brian O'Connell who was, used to be an enterprise salesperson. And he would say that's an enormous amount of people that are tire kickers that I and particularly in on it who would just never be buying from you because they don't have the money and they're an incredible waste of your time. So you have to assess pretty quickly whether they have the, the money. Is there enough pain? Uh, is it accessible? Does this fit with your founder's dream? So uh, maybe you are point blank refusing to sell to Dow Chemicals or you, uh, you uh, do not want to sell to particular types of uh, industries. So what's the size of the market in uh, total? Who are the early adopters? Or who are the people who are most likely to adopt your product? And which one do you go first? So why do they buy? Why do they care and which sector? That then, if you talk about your elevator pitch, if you can say that your market is pretty, pretty large and uh, those facts are true. So what Alejandro did with uh, one third, you can immediately put a number on it, which is a very big number. That makes people uh, sit up. And then there's lots of ways that you can actually calculate what potentially could be your... Uh, what. So in summary, you need to do your market research. You need to get a list of 50, 60 people that you know by name. You remember Cheers, but everybody knows your name. So you need to know the people that you're going to talk to. You can use LinkedIn. You can use your, your own network. And that's the stepping stone for you to have the conversations. And then just to go back to here, this primary and secondary type of uh, research. Secondary is Google. But what is most important is what we call the mom's test, which is you need to engage with people as quick as possible. And the, actually the book to read, if you want to, is actually the mom's test, which is asking about 100 people in your network 
the questions to make sure that the assumptions you're making that the idea is a good idea is correct. And maybe again, try to get a number on the, on the pane. So I'm gonna exit. I'm gonna stop sharing. Does anybody any questions? How do you discover which large company might be an early adopter? Um, the six degrees to separation. Okay, you can see from, uh, from news articles, you can identify the companies that are more progressive than, uh, than others. And if you have a wide enough network, people will point you into the direction. So when you have hundred people, so if you can believe in six degrees, a hundred people will get you hundred to the sixth this is basically everybody in the world. So the people that you know, ask them for an introduction to the people they know or ask them to the people that they know that they know and you probably get to the early adopters. But newspaper clippings, Google will pretty fast tell you which are the early adopters. How would you advise by handle being expertise? Okay, Neve. Um, and it's about bringing people in the team and getting to sign contracts. No, uh, and you don't need to get into the detail, particularly in the beginning. This needs to be a compelling idea that we can sign up. The details are uh, re re irrelevant. Most, if people go to me with, a, with a, a contract to become part of a team, I have immediately lost uh, interest. It becomes too uh, cumbersome. And uh, Helen, the, the name of the book is The Mom's Test. And if you type in Mom's Test, you will find it nearly uh, anywhere. And it literally is a very simple booklet that helps you to ask the right question in a nearly talking to your grandmother. Okay, shall I move on? We have one um, person Excellent. there, Neve. Yeah, just Neve, you can unmute yourself, I think. Hi, sorry, Ron. Uh, not if, at all. <laughs> if we do not engage with contracts, how do we protect a potentially sensitive uh, IP of our own? <sighs> Well, Liam will disagree with me. I see, I think uh, IP in a lot of cases is an incredible red herring. And uh, if you follow technology and the way exponentially technology is developing is the chances that you have something that is actually truly protectable is, uh, is, is pretty limited. And for a lot of the team members, it's probably not necessarily to be completely understand what's under the hood but okay. it's, it's, it's to understand what the thing does and what problem it, uh, it solves. So I, I don't think you need to get into the details of the intellectual property. I, I, th I think, I, and, and I, seriously, the chances that anybody is gonna steal your IP, unless it is fucking amazing, is, is slim to none, to be quite honest, I think. But uh, Liam might disagree. So Liam, if you have a perspective, um, please, please share it. Yeah, I suppose um, it depends in some senses, Niamh, if, if there are other people maybe uh, involved in your IP. So let's say, for example, the IP that you're talking about is, is attached to uh, a third level institution. Obviously, that institution would um, have a say, if you like, in terms of how that IP should be managed. So in that context, it goes back to what I said at the beginning of the, of the um, presentation. If it is university or IT or, or third level related IP, consult in the first instance with whoever is responsible for IP in your institution. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That's thank you, Liam. That's actually that's the answer. But seriously, IP in general is a red herring, and there's lots of startups that don't want to share their idea, which is the worst starting point because uh, good ideas need to be shared fast and wide. Uh, rather than being protected. So uh, NDAs and all that malarkey is just an incredible waste of time. Uh, ideas need to breed. And if you believe in iteration and, 
um, serendipity things will just go uh, a certain way and, and protecting it or not talking about it is most definitely not the way to go. Just to answer uh, Sarah, a national idea of the ground, you don't start national, you start very, very small. Uh, so I used to live in Malahide, start in Malahide rather than immediately focusing on something uh, national because what you're describing is a very big elephant and big elephants you eat in very small uh, parts. John, Facebook group, uh, there's some really interesting research done on market research and what they find is that market research most people invariably lie so rather than uh, having lots of people liking and uh, corresponding to a questionnaire which is of null and, and no value you're much better off talking to 20 people face to face particularly in the target group that you want to uh, engage with. Anybody else, any questions? How do you win over potential customers with early stage technology uh, with great difficulty is the answer, uh, Desmond. Uh, which my you, I can't emphasize the importance of a very small niche market, a hundred people where you in, in deeply engage and uh, potential customers with early stage technology that invariably is always done through a, uh, through a pilot, maybe a university collaboration or something, uh, but uh, it will always be difficult. Your business case needs to be compelling. The pain needs to be uh, considerable. And maybe then you get a, a test. So it works as a, as a, as a test or as a, as a, as a pilot. Is mentoring worthwhile? Yes, it is. Uh, where would you look for mentors? LinkedIn, your, 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 the same network that you look for your uh, potential clients is the, is the network that you look for um, for mentors. Okay, I'm gonna move on. So you have a description of your product. Excuse me. You have a price. You have a beachhead market, so now you know who you're selling to. And then uh, the thing you need to explain to that customer base is your value proposition. And the value proposition is something that is a unique benefit, which is probably provable. And it always goes back to why, 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 why. And if it's B2B, business to business, there is always a number. So the pain can always be expressed in a cost because it costs more time, it's less efficient, uh, it has more carbon. You can, there's lots of things you can, uh, you can always put a number on. So what you want to try to is find a value proposition with a huge number between compared to you and your competitors, which also means that you need to understand the competitors. So you need, but obviously, and let me show you this. This is what we ask companies to do. And this is actually uh, a company in Spain that compares their solution to um, pesticides. And they plant sexy plants, which actually um, not catch the flies. They're very attractive flies, so the flies go to the plant rather than to the, to the crops. And they save 40% of uh, cost compared to uh, pesticides, that's the thing. And, and you can put percentage on it, but you can also put a number on that uh, 40% and it is actually considerable. So the metric that's relevant, and this is what we would like you to be able to uh, express. So your solution saves the company 20%, 30%, 40% more than alternative solutions. And invariably there's a big number. And here is the, the, the kicker. Let's say this 40% is a thousand euros per acre or hectare. What's the price that you should charge for that service? Because, and this is, and, and that needs to be close to, to as close to a thousand as possible. And there's a tendency to under on the charge. And obviously the higher your value proposition is, the higher the difference in money is between your competitors and you, the higher of a price you can charge. 
the easier it becomes for you to reach the number that you want to achieve in five years time. So you know the price now based on your value proposition. You know the BTAT market that you're targeting on, the list of names that you are going to, uh, to sell to. Um, we know your product, I'm gonna come back to, to, to that. But that's lovely, but obviously you need to put this in the context of the competition. So there is, you need to look at your competitive advantage. And competitive analysis is something that is, I think the most underestimated part when you, do, uh, in this uh, stage, because it's invariably done really, really, really badly. And you need to spend some time on looking at what, who your competitors are. And then the trick is not to look at the competitors in Ireland, it's irrelevant, but to look at the competitors in, uh, in Europe. And if you're clever, you start looking for some of the more progressive uh, countries outside of Ireland, Japan, Korea, South America, uh, Brazil, uh, Canada, you name it, and actually find who those competitors are. And maybe, because you're Irish, give them a ring and ask them for some help. Because for a Korean, you as an Irish uh, startup, you are insignificant, but you can learn a tremendous amount from, uh, from them. And what you're trying to establish is, where are you different? Are you potentially not copyable? And IP obviously is not uh, copyable. And will it make it difficult for somebody else to do the same what you're doing. It again brings you down to if you have, if you're a thought leader and you have a small market of a thousand people that know you really, really well, it is really, really hard to enter that market. There's very few people that can, for example, I read lots and lots and lots of books. There's very few people in Ireland that can compete with me on the number of books that I uh, have read and have uh, written. So that's a, and it's a small niche of people that are at the moment interested in books because no, no much people read anymore, but the niche, controlling the niche is in effect already a barrier to uh, entry. This is the part that everybody hates. It's the financials, but finance is the language of business, a bank, anybody, customers. When you're business to business, it's all about money. And these are the things that you need to understand. So LTV stands for lifetime value of a customer. And if you, uh, Peter Thiel would tell you that the cost of sale needs to be lower than the lifetime value of your customer. And if you do that, so if your customer is worth over the lifetime that you have a relation with them, worth 100,000, theoretically, you could, you could spend profit. You could, so it's 100,000 profit. You could spend 99,000 on getting that uh, client. So you need to know what the lifetime value of a customer is. You need to know how long your product lasts. You need to know how many customers you need. You need to know how many times they buy their particular product. The things that everybody underestimates how much selling actually costs. Because if you sell a product, so, um, Neve, I don't know what your product is, but if you need to engage with uh, customers on a face-to-face -face basis, that costs time. That means a salesperson, and before you know it, uh, a day selling to a client, one client, basically you need to charge, you need to think about a thousand euros in, uh, in cost. So cost of sale and the time it actually costs to sell something is very much underestimated. I work with Ulster Bank and it took me 10 years to sell them to them. And so 10 years of cups of coffee, uh, conversations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually they bought, and if they would have bought something very, very small, it would have been in a colossal waste of my uh, time and it would have cost me money. So you need to understand how, how hard the cost of sales are. You obviously know how much it uh, needs to make your product, both from a production and from a service perspective. You need to understand how much profit you're making on it. The kicker is always, uh, how much do you need to get this thing kickstarted, which is a topic all in its own self. You have a profit and loss account, and then you need to understand how much you need to break even as a company, but also to break even for you to make a living. And if you go back to the flower pots, and let's say you want to earn, let's say you want to make a lot of money, so you, you want to earn 100,000 euros uh, salary per year uh, before tax, 
and the margin on a flower pot is one euro, how many flower pots do you need to sell? And that's a kicker almost from the word go uh, from startup. And actually the answer to this question now is a hundred thousand flower pots, which is about 200 per, 200 per week, 50 per, 40 per day. So from the word go, you need to be able to sell 40 flower, flower pots per day for you to make a living and eat. So that's a particular head threat that you need to uh, understand. And then the last one is you need to understand the impact that you're making. And in exactly the same way as you're doing this, you can express your solution compared to the solution of your competitors in carbon, water, pollution. And the good news is because of regulation, and because of risk, there's, and, and you can actually put a number on that as well. So it becomes a part of your financial model. Now, that was, I'm gonna stop sharing. Anybody, any questions? Ron Emer has um, her hand up there. So I'll just allow her to speak there. Yeah, Emer. Um, I'm so sorry. I didn't even mean to put my hand up. I don't have a question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Not at all. You want to sing a song instead? No? No, you're all right. Um, I'll leave that to you. Thank you. Sorry, though. Not at all. Anybody else? Oh, now, Thomas, when do I take the leap of failed and leave employment to focus on startup? Uh, you stay in your job as long as you possibly can before you take the jump. Uh, because the, the road is littered with startups, people that start too, uh, too soon. The chance of success are incredibly limited, 50% in uh, three years. So you want to be pretty, pretty sure that you're doing something that makes sense. And the, the only indication that something actually makes financial sense is the first client buying your product or service and preferably at the numbers that you can start seeing some salary and uh, the, 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 the normal, what's the word? You should probably have a year salary in the bank for you to be able to start comfortably because you have to, you have to bank on it that for the first two or three years, you're gonna earn next to nothing. So the financial risk that you're taking is considerable. So I would, I would not leave on, employment until I'm pretty, pretty sure that you can do it. And then this whole malarkey from uh, focus on a startup. If you think that uh, combining a startup with empl employment is hard, try working 80 hours a week on just the startup. So uh, it's not going to get easier. So I would stay in employment as long as you uh, can. I'm just going to finish this, this thing. Uh oh. Isn't that wonderful? This technology great. Now I can't find my own presentation. Would you like me to share your presentation? Ron? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Tara. And it's literally two slides. Um, Are you sharing it? Oh yeah, thank you. So we go all the way down, all the way down, and we're going to uh, that one. So this was very fast and actually faster than I uh, expected. I was hoping we'd have a little bit more time for you to actually work through those things, but I, uh, I would like you to, if you want to, and if you want feedback, send me the problem, magic and solution, and the, in the climate launch part, the, the dream, the deal, the value proposition, the financial metrics, all the things that I've discussed in the, in the slide. And, uh, I will, uh, and if you have any sp specific questions, please uh, let me know. And I will, between now and the next session, 
I will uh, answer as much as I uh, can. So for next time, ta -ta -ta -ta. so mail me the questions. I, uh, after this, Liam and the team will send you a little book which are some of the thinking around entrepreneurship. You don't have to read it, but, uh, but it gives a number of perspectives around entrepreneurship and what you should and shouldn't do. There's a perspective on intrapreneurship. There's some uh, thinking around uh, the things you should and shouldn't do. The whole idea of execution versus uh, idea. There's a, a reference to uh, Peter Thiel's book, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's something to give you a framework to, to think. And what I'll be focusing on is the next time is your information dashboard, because this is about the future and strategy, which give you some tools to develop a strategy to get from here to where you want to be in five years time. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm really sorry I ran over time, but honestly, feel free to send me any email questions that you want and I will answer them all as quick as I can. Thank you. That's great, Ron. Thanks so much for that. And um... Thanks to everybody that came online today. Um, everybody that came on stayed on, which is which is always good news. Uh, and particularly thanks to the people who shared their questions. Yes. Um, came on and shared their question. That's it. Really adds to the uh, experience. I think when you're doing the online training to see and hear from other people uh, during the session. So I'd invite you all to, as Ron said, if you have any questions. Any suggestions, you need a bit of help over the next two weeks before the April 15th session, get in contact with Ron, do a bit of work on the model, make use of this opportunity now to, to really start to build out your model. And we'll send you the various links that Ron mentioned um, and uh, some of the detail in terms of the presentations today and so on. We'll send you those by email. So thanks everybody. See you, bye-bye.